Friday. We're glad you're here. Great to see you, Brooke. It's you. Amen. I'm glad Brooke's feeling better. Amen. Her and Jody. It's been a tough ride. We got folks we're praying for. Pray for Ernie that he gets better. Pray for Ernie and Cindy and, and uh, Sherman and others that have been having some struggles. Let's pray for them. Lift them up in our prayers and uh, that God will get them through. Jesse, good to see you. We pray for you and uh, appreciate you. And uh, let's, let's, try to, let's try to help each other through. Amen. Pray each other through. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray and then we're going to get right into our study of the book of Colossians tonight. So if you're watching on live stream, thank you for being a part of our group. Turn to the book of Colossians. Get ready. And then we'll jump right into, right into our study. All right, Father, we love you. Thank you for a great group of folks that are here uh, tonight. I pray that you would bless in our children's program. Be, be with them there. Bless this Bible study. And uh, I pray that um, you might instruct us and teach us, speak to our hearts through your wonderful word. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for all of it. In the name of Jesus Christ. We pray these things. Amen. Now in our study of these New Testament books, in particular uh, the Pauline epistles where we have been at, uh, we've seen some cosmopolitan cities. Okay? We've visited some pretty big places uh, in, in these epistles where Paul writes a letter back to the church. Uh, Corinth and Ephesus uh, among them. Uh, the city of Philippi, uh, these are all cosmopolitan cities where even in our day and time they would be large uh, cities, especially in that day and time, they were enormous uh, people groups that were gathered in these cities. But in the book of Colossian, Colossians, which was written to the church at Colossae, um, we come to something different. It is a, it's a small market town. And so we're not now finding ourselves in a huge church, in a huge city, uh, in this part of the world. Colossae was situated on the southern bank of the Lycus River, about a hundred miles east of Ephesus. Okay, now that's important to remember. It's about 100 miles east of Ephesus, and to the south of it, at, 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 the, at the foot of Mount Tadmus, which was known uh, by the Turks as the Father of Mountains, at the foot of that is where uh, the city of Colossae was settled. There were two other cities in the Lycus River Valley that were of note. One was Hierapolis, uh, Hierapolis and then the other was Laodicea. Okay? We're familiar with with the names of both of those cities from the Bible, in particular uh, uh, the, the city of Laodicea. And we, we know about the letter to the Laodicean church uh, in the book of Revelation. Both of, these, both of these cities were located, they were located about a day's journey uh, from uh, Colossae. And at the time of this epistle, the time of this letter from Paul to the church at Colossae, both of these cities, Hierapolis and, um, and Laodicea, were both larger and more important than was Colossae. So, so it was the lesser of the three cities there in the Lycus River Valley. But it had known its days of glory. Um, there was a time when Colossae was, was, a, was a far more significant city um, Quite honestly, we probably wouldn't know anything about Colossae in our world had it not been for the letter that Paul wrote back to the church there. It, we, we wouldn't have known anything about it. But there was a day that it had, it had its, its glory. It was known for a textile industry and for the fact that they produced a wool. Uh, it was a deep red wool uh, that, was, that was noted as Colossae wool. And so... Uh, it, 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 it was, it, that was their product, you know, it's sort of like, you know, the corn state, uh, you know, the states that are known for watermelon, whatever, that was their deal. 
they produced a, a deep red wool and it was named after them. The main road, the main road from Ephesus to the Euphrates ran through the town and the armies of Xerxes and Cyrus had passed down that road and through the city of Colossae. It's, it's, it's at this time, at this time when the book is written, it is a mixture of Phrygians, Greeks, and Jews. And they're all, they're all there. So it's sort of a little bit of a melting pot from that region during um, uh, the day. So they're, they're, they're all there. Um, let me give you a verse, and I want you to think about this verse for a moment. In, in John chapter 8, let me just read this to you, and let me use that as a springboard into some things I want to stay, say, and then we're going to get into some scripture in Colossians. But in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he, pros he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's a powerful description of the serpent, of Satan. He's, the, he's a liar. He's the father of lies. There is no truth in him whatsoever. And so as the God of this world, he's the one that inspires and perpetuates all the falsehoods that are behind the false religions. You name a false religion, Satan's behind it. You name something that's known as a church that's got false doctrine and false religion, Satan's behind it. Okay? He's duped, he has duped tens of thousands, uh, 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 tens, of thousands tens of billions over the years um, to follow after Mariology and to bow to Mary, and to pray to Mary. And, and uh, it's just unbelievable, the false religions of our world and how people are duped. It's because the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes. What's he blinded them to? He's blinded them to the truth of the true word of the living God. And ever since Cain brought that very first work-based offering rather than a blood sacrifice offering, Man has been trying somehow, whether by um, baptism, um, whether by the sacraments, you know, whether by good works, whether by keeping holy days, somehow man has been trying to work his way and scrounge his way and pay his way and earn his way to heaven. You can't do it because it's by grace that you're saved. Let me tell you what you deserve. You deserve hell. That's exactly what I deserve. If we got what we deserved, we would all die and go to hell. But I don't get what I deserved. You know why? Because on that tree, Jesus died in my place. And he died in your place. And so all I get is the gracious glory and grace and mercy of a loving God who did for me what I could not do for myself. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. Amen? And I'm glad for that. I'm thankful, I'm thankful for that truth. And, and if you'll notice history, just go back in history. Um, I, I saw something um, the other day about Genghis Khan and his Mongolian Empire. When they were on this earth, they killed so many people that they decreased the population of the world by 11%. That's a staggering thought. It's a staggering thought. Not only that, but he fathered so many children throughout his empire that there's a large percentage of people in the world that somewhere down the line got Genghis Khan's blood in them. So uh, that's why my temper. Uh, that's why I lose it every now and then. And I have a tendency to want to draw, grow a man bun. Anyhow, I, I don't know. So, uh, yeah, so uh, if you follow these guys, here's what you'll find. They believe 
that if you tell a lie enough and you repeat it over and over, bold enough and brazen enough, people will what? They're going to believe it. Okay? Listen to me. That was the basis behind the propaganda machine of the Third Reich in Nazi Germany was just grab a lie and keep telling it. Grab a lie. Just keep telling the lie. Keep telling the lie. Sooner or later, somebody's going to say, well, it must be true. I've heard it all, you know, for, for, the, for the last so many years, and, and they buy into it. Um, and that's what's happened. How many of you went to see the Ark in the Darkness? How many of you got to do that? Okay, number of you. Powerful, wasn't it? It's amazing. Amazing. Here's the lie that's been promoted. Much of the world today believes that we evolved from apes. Can you imagine that? We're created in the image of God, the Bible said. And yet there are people that believe that we came from a lower form of life, that came from a lower form of life, that came from a lower form of life, that came from the lowest form of life, that came from the great buying, and nobody knows where the great buying came from. But, but that's, how, that's how professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, okay? I'll just say it without any hesitation or apology. We got a lot of fools with doctor's degrees behind their name, teaching at our public universities because they deny the very existence of God. Go out and look at the stars tonight. I mean, just watch the sunset. I mean, if you believe that all that came by happen chance, then you also have to believe that that clock evolved somehow on that wall. And it wasn't here five years ago, but all of a sudden there was a dot up there, and from the dot came, you know, some works, and from the works came some hands, and we had a clock evolve on the wall. It's more of a chance of that clock evolving than you and I evolving. We were created in the image of God. And, and they believe that the earth is billions of years old. Okay. They toss years around like Bill Gates does dollars and the idea that God doesn't really uh, exist. Now stay with me because I'm going to a, per a certain place where we're going to park in the book of Colossians. Okay, so, so, so stay with me. I know many of you are thinking now, he's rambling. He does this a lot. He's rambling again. Listen to me. But when Jesus Christ came to this world, He came as truth incarnate. He was the embodiment. He was truth. Pilate said, Pilate uh, questioned Him, you know, what is truth? Well, Pilate, you may not realize this, but truth is standing in front of you. He, he, is, he is all there is about truth. Without sin, God manifest in human flesh, and Satan and his demonic forces trembled. You remember, you remember when Jesus would come up upon demon-possessed people, the demons would cry out and say, Don't, don't, no, just don't, you know, you know, don't, don't send us back to hell, you know, and he, he put them in swine, and the swine ran into the deep. And there were times the conversations between Jesus and the imps of hell show their fear of him. So when truth came to the world, the father of lies and all of his demonic liars, they trembled at the presence of truth incarnate. And, and um, Satan tried to have Jesus murdered as a baby so that he would be silenced. That didn't work. He urged men to nail him to the cross and then sat back with, with great satisfaction as the limp body of Jesus was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. But Jesus conquered the grave, thank God, and rose from the dead. And, and he ascended from the Mount of Olives and said to them, I must go so that I can send to you, who? The Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit of God. And he said, he will be two things, with you and in you. So he's not only with us as we go about, but he's in us. So the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father. The Holy Spirit of God now indwells every single believer. He lives inside of you. There is no temple on this earth any longer where the Shekinah, glory of God indwells. Now the Shekinah glory, the glory of God through the person of the Holy Spirit indwells us because we know what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? 
and, 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 and you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Paul wrote the Corinthian church. And so you are the temple. I am the temple, okay, of, of God. And so the Holy Spirit, if you remember Acts chapter 2, empowered the New Testament church that Jesus instituted, okay? Stay with me. Stay with me. Jesus instituted the New Testament church, and He empowered it, okay? He began it way back here. He empowered it on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God came upon them. And, and uh, from that time throughout the book of Acts, which we're studying in my Sunday school classes, is, is just amazing and is, and is fascinating. Uh, and and I, I think, I would think, okay, here's Jesus, He's gone. Okay, Mount of Olives, Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the heaven? For this same Jesus, have you seen go into heaven, shall so come in like manner, have you seen him go? I have no doubt in my mind that the spirit, that, 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 that Satan, the, the God of this world, when Jesus ascended, had to think, who's he leaving behind? <laughs> Peter, the denier? James and John snapped every now and then, wanted to blow people up, burn them down, you know. Really? Thomas the doubter? you got to be kidding me. I have no doubt that Satan thought in his mind that this assembly of believers that Jesus have said, as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you, Satan probably thought, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have short work of them. I'm going to have short work of them. They're... They are humans, and I have broken humans throughout history from the beginning of the garden until this very day. So what did he do? Study your church history. He sent wave after wave of persecution against the church. He burned them at the stake. He had them fed to lions. He, he slew them to the cheers of the Colosseum crowds. He forced them to hide. He forced them to hide in the catacombs. He hauled them out of their houses and had them beaten to death with rocks. He hunted and he hounded them for, for hundreds of years. But think of this. This is amazing. The tax collector, the zealot, those rough fishermen, do you know what they did? They turned the world upside down. All of hell was thrown against them. All of hell rose up against them. And those simple men were so powerful in their faith that they ultimately sealed their faith with their own blood, they died for him in foreign fields all over the place. Peter crucified upside down. Some of them uh, thrust through with a dart. I mean, horrible deaths. John the Beloved dipped in boiling oil and exiled to Patmos by, by Domitian. I'm, I'm just telling you, those common men turned the world upside down. And down through the centuries... <laughs> The little cobbler, the local butcher, the village tinker, the simple farmer, the little mother feeding chickens out in the yard. You know what happened? When they met Jesus Christ, the risen Savior, and the Holy Spirit of God moved inside of them, they were transformed into mighty people of faith. Listen carefully. And on their knees, they made the kingdom of darkness tremble. Just average people. Just you and me people. Just, just shoe leather people. On their knees. The church that Satan thought would be easy pickings now turned the kingdom of darkness on its heels. So what did Satan do? He did the one thing 
that he could do to stop the church, he corrupted it. That was his new tactic. Okay, I can't torture them. They won't quit when I torture them. I can't burn them. They, they wash their hands in the fire. I, I, can't, I can't drag them out of their houses because their houses multiply. I can't stop the church through blood and suffering and pain. So now what I have to do is I have to infiltrate the church and I have to corrupt it from within. And so he sent people to alter the truth, to take a word out here or add a word there. He attacked the word of God. He slipped in legalism. He slipped in ritualism. He slipped in intellectualism. And he infiltrated the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now, here we are in Colossians. Go to chapter 1. Because that's exactly what is happening in Colossians. People have infiltrated the church. False teachers have infiltrated the church. And this is what they're basically saying. Guys, you don't have to be saved. Jesus was a good man, a good teacher. But for Pete's sake, he wasn't God. He wasn't God in human flesh. He was a rabbi. He had some good principles. He taught us how to live a decent life on this earth, but, but he's not the savior of the world. And they begin, to, they begin to bring their agenda into the church and bring their false doctrine into the church. And listen, and like a cancer, they corrupted the church from the inside. I can't stop this church, but I can corrupt it. And when I corrupt it, it'll cease to be what God wanted it to be. So, so Colossians chapter 1, let me, let me show you some scripture that'll show you a little bit about what he did in, his, in this short letter, but one of the most brilliantly, powerfully written letters. We understand he wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And so it, it's, it's powerful. Verse number um, 12 of chapter 1, "...giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers." of the inheritance of the saints in light, watch, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Talk about being a Savior. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You know what he's saying? If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. If you know Jesus, you know God. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities and powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Remember this? Without Him was not anything made that was made. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So Paul is saying... Have you forgot what I taught you? Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator. All things were made by him. All things were made for him. Um, uh, in verse 17, he's before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven, and you who that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in, uh, grounded in the faith and settled to be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which he have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Paul saying, don't let go of what I taught you. 
No, no, this church will never go on if you lose sight of the true gospel. And he's saying to them, don't you remember when you were saved? Okay. Then, then jump with me to chapter 2. He now talks about people enticing them. Verse 4, In this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And that's exactly what had happened. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Then he starts uh, again talking to them about mysticism that this group had brought in. Verse number 18 of the same chapter, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have having nourishment ministered and knit together in, increaseth with the increase of God. So, so he, he, he continues down in, in, in his warning about people that are living according uh, to the flesh. Now, let me just say this to you. Listen carefully. Paul writes back to this church and he said, Don't you know you got saved? He, he redeemed you through his blood. Why are you letting these people come in and bring these off the, the, these, uh, uh, off the uh, cuff doctrines into your assembly, which not, are, are not, any, not even biblical. Can, can I help you with this? Be careful with guys that are spending their life trying to impress you with how much they know. If they're using language that you don't understand, I'd steer clear of them. I was reading something today where some guys... And I knew exactly what he was talking about, but he's, he's talking, they, they got all, they've got all these cutesy things that they've created, you know, to cover up the fact that they're, they're basically, they're, they're twisting the doctrine of the New Testament church, okay? And, 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 and yet they're veiling it, rather than just coming right out and saying, look, we burned out on church, man, we're mad, we, we're doing our own thing. Rather than doing that, they're trying, to, they're trying to create this smoke screen where you look at them and say, dude, he must really know a lot. If somebody, if, if, listen, when you hear somebody speak, when you hear somebody speak and you come away from their speaking and you think to yourself, that guy knows a lot. You, you got the wrong impression. I mean, that may be his intention and giving you that impression, we're not supposed to come away with saying great man. We're supposed to be coming away with saying great book, great God. Okay. Put, Billy Sunday used to say, I want to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody can reach them. When somebody's, when somebody's talking in a language where you walk away and say, I'm not sure what he's talking about, but son, I'm telling you, he staggered me with his knowledge. Uh, that's somebody looking for a spotlight and somebody looking for praise. Just lay it out plain and clear and, 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 and get the job done. And so he's telling them, he's telling them, you guys, you, you've got these people in here and they're beguiling you. You're sitting back stunned like, man, this guy's this guy great at oration. It ought never be that way. We ought to bring the Word of God in simplicity and truth. I don't ever want anybody leaving South Valley Baptist Church scratching their head wondering, what did he say? And if they do, I want them to at least to say, Pastor, I didn't grasp that. I didn't quite understand it. Could you go back over that with me and explain that to me? I'll be more than happy to do that. I love those kind of questions, and I'm willing to go back over. And, and every now and then I'll get a text and say, Okay, I can, can you just explain this point? I need to get this point down, and I'm more than happy to do that. We're not trying to hide truth. We're trying to tell truth. False teachers 
False teachers are trying to hide their lies by mixing it and veiling it behind some of the truth of the Word of God. Now, that's what happened, and that's the reason for the book at Colossae, the book of Colossians, the letter from Paul to the Colossian church. That's why we have this book, is because false teachers infiltrated them and began to change the doctrine and, and change the structure of that church from the inside. Now, I want to give us some very practical things that'll, that'll take us a little deeper uh, into this, okay, in, into this book. First, first practical point I want to make with you is this, and that is the faith once delivered must be continually guarded. Don't you think that's what it teaches us? The faith once delivered to the saints has to be continually guarded. We are guardians of truth. That's what we are as a New Testament church. We're guardians of truth. And so what happened at the church at Colossae, Paul gets a report that the church has been confused by false teachers bringing false doctrine uh, and, uh, into the assembly. And so Paul writes back to them. Now go with me to Jude. Go with me to the book of Jude. Okay, let's everybody go to Jude. Jude chapter 5. When you're there, wait on me. <laughs> All right, go to Jude. Who are in the book of Jude? Look in verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should what? Earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay, all right, wait a minute. So I've been given the faith. It was delivered to me. Somebody told me about Jesus. I got saved. It's a common salvation. Everybody's got, if you've got salvation, that's the only salvation you've got. Okay. So why do I have to contend for it? Here it is, verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who before of old, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward, what's that next word? Destroyed them which believed not. Now, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. That's hard language. Here's what he's saying. Guys, you're going to have to contend for the faith. The the faith once delivered to you, you can't just sit back with it and stick it in your back pocket and say, it's all good. No, no. You're going to have to contend for that faith. You've got to guard it. There's going to be times you're going to have to struggle. That word contend means to struggle, to fight. You're going to have to struggle and fight for the faith that was once given you. Why? Because they're infiltrators and people that creep in unawares and they're trying to change the belief that, that, God, that God delivered to you in, in, into something else. And so he's telling them uh, that they're going to have to go to war with people that try to assail it. Now, I'm not talking about getting a gun or, or punching somebody in the face. I'm talking about you, you've got to stand up. We have to be guardians. We've got to be guardians of the truth that was given to us. Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus said this, Beware of false prophets which come into you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Paul talked to the uh, um, uh, Ephesian elders in chapter 20, the book of Acts, in verse 29, and he said this, For I know this, Paul said, I, there's something I know. I know what's going to happen, guys. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And so the reality of the matter is we're being warned here in the Scripture. As Paul did, South Valley Baptist Church is going to have to contend for the truth once delivered to the saints. Now, that is sometimes the worst part of my job, but that is my job. Okay. My job is to make sure we love everybody, we love people, we're after people, we want people, we want to help people, we want to invite people, we want to welcome people, we are people. 
Okay? I am, I am, you're shocked, but I am. Like the kid prayed one time, God bless the creature. No, it's the preacher. But anyhow, no, so, 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 so we're, we're after people. But, but I'm going to tell you this. When somebody comes in and they've got an agenda and they're bringing in doctrine that is not consistent with the, with the faith that was once delivered to us, listen to me, the faith that this church was built upon, that, 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 that's not going to happen. And, and, and that's my job. That's what I have to do. And I have to be man enough to confront that and to deal with that. And, and sometimes it's not neat and tidy. You know why? Because they're called wolves. Next time you see a wolf, if you can get close enough, pet him. <laughs> wolves don't receive petting and hugging very kindly. It's never neat and, and, and tidy, and there's a lot of noise. And sometimes there's fur flying, and sometimes there's blood. But you can't let a wolf into the sheepfold, or the wolf will destroy the sheep. And the church is called upon to defend its doctrines and practices against false teachers. Now, look, we probably all differ on some things. Okay? We probably all have differences. That doesn't mean that somebody's a heretic because they believe this or that. That, that doesn't, we, we, we can't, we don't care. Just because you don't agree with me on a certain issue doesn't categorize that. It's, it's when your issue is your agenda and, and you're trying to, you're trying to uh, uh, change everything that everybody else believes. We, we all have different things. One of the things this church has been built upon is the fact that you have the right to be wrong. Amen? Okay, thank both of you. Listen to John chapter 10. Listen to what Jesus said. John 10, 13, Jesus said, the, hire, the hireling fleeth. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I, I could sit on that chair right there. And we could all pull chairs up around and I could tell you stories and I could title my speech this, Wolves I Have Known. In times, times that I've had to sit down with people and, and do battle with people over, over this book. In times when people didn't understand what the battle was all about. And sometimes I got accused for the noise and the blood and the fur and everything else. And I'm just going to tell you, listen. We're to contend for the faith. Anybody that's watching live stream, I would say this to them. If you're in a church where a pastor is willing to contend and stay with the faith and stay faithful, you, you better plug in and be thankful for that. Because that's the worst part of the ministry. But it is a necessary part of the ministry. Number two, God, practical point number two, God can multiply your fish and your loaves, okay? God can multiply your fish and your loaves. How many of you make homemade bread? Could I see your hands? If you make homemade bread, could I see your hands? Okay, please keep them up. All right, I'm just trying to identify who I need to see. And uh, man, may your loaves be multiplied, amen? I love homemade bread, my word. And uh, yeah, too much. So, uh, but God can multiply your fish and loaves. Let me give you an interesting fact. You ready for this? Here's an interesting fact about Colossians. Paul never visited there. He's never there. Paul never went to Colossae. Like the other churches that he writes back to, Ephesus, Paul spent over two years in Ephesus. He didn't spend a single day in Colossae. So what happened? Well, we don't know totally, but as we read through um, like Colossians chapter 1, look in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Okay, that's a, that's a neat statement. Chapter 4, go to chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 12. Epaphras, look at this next statement. Who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that he may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. Now, we don't, the Bible doesn't say, okay, this is what happened on this day, but this is what we think happened. Paul is 100 miles away in Ephesus. 
He's winning people to Christ and planting a New Testament church that we know as the church at Ephesus, which the, the, the book of Ephesus was written to. It's a Pauline epistle, a letter from Paul to the church. While Paul was there, while Paul was there, people were getting saved. Now, 100 miles is, isn't very far today, but it was a long time back then. But evidently, people came from Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, and they traveled to Ephesus because they heard of this stuff going on in Ephesus, we think. And Epaphras, who was a young man, heard the gospel and got saved. So during those two years, Paul was able to disciple Epaphras. Epaphras now goes back to the Lycus River Valley and, and Archippus plants a church in Laodicea, we think. Um, um, and, and Epaphras plants a church in Colossae. So here we have a young man that planted a church after being led to Christ by the Apostle Paul and Paul had no idea. Can you imagine this? Here's the Apostle Paul in Ephesus spending two years and three months, and he's giving them line upon line, precept upon precept. He's having meetings just like this, Bible meetings, where he's breaking the Word of God down to people and explaining to them and talking to them. He has no idea that this guy sitting right over there is going to go back to his region, like his river valley, and he's going to plant the church at Colossae. But that's the power of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. It's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing how, how that God works in, in such a great way. The great missionary to South Africa, remind me. No, he's Africa, S South Africa. Somebody know? Yeah, Bobby Moffat. So, so Robert Moffat. You, you know the story of him. He's, he's a kid. He gets saved in a church. He's the only kid saved that year. So the deacons get together, the men of the church. They have a meeting with the pastor, and they said, look, it hadn't been a very good year. We had one kid saved. We, Bobby Moffat, we feel like we can do better, and you can do better. You go your way. We'll go our way. And so basically they fired the pastor. He walked off dejected thinking that just one little kid, Robert Moffat, got saved. We, Bobby Moffat, got born again. What he did not know was that kid that got saved in that church that year became the great missionary that, that, that made inroads into South Africa. One of the greatest missionaries that ever lived was Robert Moffat. Moffat comes back and he's telling the stories of seeing 10,000 campfires where no white man had ever gone. And sitting there is a guy by the name of David Livingston. And Livingston says in that meeting, I'm going to be the man that takes the gospel to those 10,000 villages. And so don't ever underestimate the power of the gospel. Here's a little pastor in a little church in Scotland. Nobody knows his name. But Robert Moffat got saved. Robert Moffat speaks and Livingston has his life changed. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because it's the power of God unto salvation um, uh, to, to, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. July the 1st, 1885, Edward Kimball cannot escape the pressing of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God has led him on several occasions to witness to this young shoe salesman but he hesitates, and it finally gets so overwhelming that he knows he has to take the gospel. So he sits the young shoe salesman down, and he shares the gospel with him. And Dwight Lyman Moody trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior and becomes the greatest evangelist of his generation and shook two continents for Christ. He speaks in England. He goes from America to England, and he speaks out in a huge area of past your area where gypsies were at and there's this young kid standing there listening and he walks up to to Moffat and and, and uh, uh, talks with him and Ira Sankey and he said I want you to know I trusted Christ today and this little kid Rodney Smith became the great evangelist that was known as Gypsy Smith and people said that Gypsy Smith preached to Jesus like no man ever had before 
is just never underestimate the power of the gospel. Several years later, a pastor by the name of F.B. Meyer heard Moody preach, and Meyer was so stirred by Moody's preaching that he himself surrendered and went out on an evangelistic ministry. One day when he was preaching, a college student by the name of J. Wilbur Chapman heard a message by F.B. Meyer, and J. Wilbur Chapman got saved. Chapman later surrendered his life for ministry and became a famous evangelist in America. After time, he had hired a young man that was a former baseball player to work with him. When he, when he surrendered to pastor a church, he looked at his associate who just all he did was went ahead of him and set the meetings up and made sure things were in order. He says to young William Ashley Sunday, Billy Sunday, you got to hold these, you got to finish these meetings up. I've got schedule. Billy Sunday said, I don't have any messages. He said, I've got six. Here, just preach them over and over again. Billy Sunday was the greatest evangelist that America ever knew. It was single-handedly responsible for, for the, the repeal uh, of prohibition. He, 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 brought, he brought it in to where America went dry for a while. In 1924, a group of businessmen invited Billy Sunday to an evangelistic campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina. It resulted in so many people coming to Christ. Because of that revival, the, the, the businessmen formed a men's prayer group uh, to pray for the world. And they began to pray for Charlotte. God, do it again. God, do something in Charlotte like you did back when Billy Sunday was here. God, we remember that day. Give us something else like you did then. And so as they prayed, as they prayed, God sent to them a man by the name of Mordecai Ham. Southern evangelist that preached the Word of God. Ham went to Charlotte in 1934 to hold a crusade, and it went so well. There weren't a lot of people saved at that crusade. But on one night, a tall, sandy-haired young man walked the aisle to receive Christ. His family called him Billy Frank, but he became known as Billy Graham, and he preached to billions, literally billions of people. I'm just saying... Listen, you sow, he'll grow. You sow, he'll grow. The track you give, the track that you give may be somebody that makes an impact for Christ. I told you about the missionary to Slovakia that was working in a tire shop. He's sitting down on a stool at lunch hour. He had helped some guys get a tire on their car. A guy walked in up to him and said, here, read this. Gave him a track and walked out. He never saw him since, but he got born again sitting on that stool, reading that track, later surrendered his life and became a missionary to Slovakia. Just saying, you sow, he grows. I don't have to save anybody, but I can give them the opportunity to hear the gospel and then God can do the work in their life. Never underestimate the power of the gospel. Lesson number three. This is so important. Little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. Corinth had 600,000 people in it. Son, they need a church, don't they? 600,000? Yeah, somebody got to go there. Somebody got to go to Corinth. Somebody got to plant a church there. Ephesus had 350,000 themselves. Somebody's got to go to Ephesus and preach a church. These, these big cities, they need Christ. The Colossae had a population of 20,000 at the max, 25,000. Dude, it was small time. Don't blink when you go through. You'll miss it. Why would you waste your time? Why, why would you waste your time going there? It's because the little towns filled with people, as much as the big city was, not as many people, but everywhere, everywhere that people can be found, on the mountains and in the valleys, inner city and upper class neighborhoods, in the, in the big cities and the small rural farming communities, there's a need. There's nooks and crannies in these mountains of Idaho that are staggering. They're everywhere. 
Would to God we had an old itinerant preacher. They used to ride mules. You don't have to ride mules anymore. But somebody that would get in a car and, and, and just hold meetings in little cities all over the place and say, okay, I'll be back on this date. We'll, have, we'll get together. We'll spend that Sunday together. Would to God we had Brush Arbor meetings where people would come and hear the Word of God. Listen to me. Driggs, Idaho. Driggs, Idaho. We've got a church building there. We've got people there. We need somebody to surrender to come to Driggs because God's doing some moving there with, with Daniel McDonald that we, that we planted. We had our fellowship meeting up in Idaho Falls on Monday and Tuesday, and I preached on Tuesday, and, and, and we just employed, guys, we've got to pray. Don't let this church go. It's in the middle of a rural farming area that needs the gospel. We, we, we got to, and, and that's just one. The Northwest has little towns everywhere that need a Bible preaching church. Listen to me, it's, it's, it's not just Atlanta, it's not just St. Louis, it's not just these big bustling towns. Every little community, the people in that community, if you drive past a place and there's five houses out there, did you know that everybody living in those five houses is going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell? One or the other. So there are no, there are no important places. There are no big places. They're just God's places where we've got to get. And little is much when God is in it. And we've got to get the gospel. Everybody knows where Boise is, but nobody knows where Kuna is. I can tell them a hundred times that when they, Brother Dean's here to preach for us tonight. Brother Dean pastors the South Valley Baptist Church in Kuna, Idaho. People, can you pronounce things right, please? Kuna, Idaho. That's okay. Nobody knows where Kuna's at. But God does. God does. Everybody in Cuna, everybody in Meridian, everybody in Nampa, everybody in Caldwell, everybody in Boise, everybody in Garden City, everybody in Eagle, everybody everywhere, everybody everywhere, every human being is going to spend eternity either in heaven or hell, and we've got to get the gospel to them. Last of all, boy, I wish this would soak in. The time is short. You're never going to regret a dollar you give to missions. I'm so burdened for our state. I'm so burdened for our, our, the Mountain West. I'm so burdened for it. We got guys that are trying to carve something out and do a work and they're discouraged. They're hurting. They're hurting. Young guys resigning their churches because they're discouraged. And I, I'm, I'm praying and thinking, we've got we've to find a way that we can encourage people. Stick at it. Stay at it. Stay with it. Don't quit. Don't quit. It's like, it's like in Nehemiah's day. Remember, the wall was half finished and Judah said, we can't do this. No, no, no. Don't you dare quit at halftime. Don't you walk away with halftime. Don't you quit. No, we've gone this far. Are you kidding me? We'll, look at me. We're 18 years into this. Don't walk away. Don't quit. I'm not quitting at 18 years. No, we got work to do. Jesus is coming back. I don't know when he's coming back. I'm shocked that he didn't come Tuesday. 4 4.8. 8. It's amazing what happened. I was just jumping and nothing happened. And so I don't know. I love... I love good doctrinal prophecy where people are just so staggeringly accurate. It's amazing to me. I'll say this again. It's not my job to know when Jesus is coming back. It's to tell people that He is, to share the gospel with them so that they can be ready when He does. Okay. Anytime anybody, listen to me, anytime anybody starts pinpointing a date, walk away. Yeah, but pastor... They talked about the budding of the olive tree. Yeah, I've heard that since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Okay, they're twisting, they're taking a little bit of scripture and twisting it, okay? I had a friend of mine that posted on Facebook. <laughs> I loved it. In fact, it was Clint Minnick that we just voted to, to support there in, in, uh, 
in California. He posted this. He said, I'm not trying to brag, but I've been through 10 uh, uh, ending of the worlds, okay, and survived. So I just thought that's hysterical. That's true, man. You know what? Listen to me. Don't bother nobody. The nutcakes will reload again. Amen. Some going to come up. Some going to come up next year and they're going to be saying, son, you know, have you heard the Katie dids lately? You know, they're making a lot of racket at night down by the pond. Y'all know what the Katie did is? Okay. Sorry. Anyhow, it's from the South. Anyhow, it's your neighbor screaming at each other. No, it's not. Anyhow. All right. Now watch me and I'm going to close. Epaphras is visiting Paul. And he says to Paul, we got a problem at Colossae. Paul's never been there. He doesn't know these people, but they know him because their pastor probably was saved. At least the people in the Lycus River Valley were influenced by Paul's ministry in Ephesus and came back and planted these churches. And so, uh, and, and so they know. So Paul now writes them a letter as sort of an, he's sort of like an old timer. You know what I mean? He's sort of like a, he's not a novice. And they listen to Paul because he's a wise man and everybody holds him in high regard be, because he was influenced. I mean, if I, if I brought Bobby Richardson in this room, as many times as you've heard Bobby Richardson's name given, you, you would at least shake his hand and say, thank you for leading our pastor to Christ. That, that's the situation with Epaphras. So now he's with Paul. He's saying, Paul, we've got a problem in the church. Can you help me figure out how to deal with this? And so, and so, so Paul writes the letter, and he, and he says to them in chapter 4, verse 5, chapter 4, verse 5 uh, of Colossians, he says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. What is he talking about? Get busy. Win people to Christ. Walk in wisdom with people that aren't in your church, that are in your community, redeeming the time. Watch. Verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how we ought to answer every man. So here's what Paul says. Okay, guys, listen. I'm writing you this book. Let's get this straight. And now, now that I've leveled that out with you and told you Jesus is the Son of God, don't let any man beguile you. Don't listen to false prophets. Guys, look at me. Look at me. we got to redeem the time. Time's running out. We have to redeem the time. We've got to get busy reaching people that are without. You talk with them with grace. Why? Because it's our job to reach it's your job, Colossae, to reach the Lycus River Valley. That's what Paul said to that church. What Paul did not know when he penned those words, and what the members of the church at Colossae did not know when they received the letter, was they had one year left. Because within one year, after the writing of this letter, the church at Colossae was destroyed by an enormous earthquake that wrecked the Lycus River Valley. Gone. There's nothing there today but a few rubbled stones above ground. No streets, no shops. You would never even know that people lived there. The only one of the cities that was able to rebuild because of their wealth was Laodicea. And we know how that went from the book of Revelation. I'm just saying that time is short. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 1. Proverbs, uh, Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. James 4, 14, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeared for a little while. And then vanisheth away. My pastor used to say this, and it's so true. Tomorrow is the first word in the devil's vocabulary. We don't have. We don't know. They didn't know how many tomorrows they had. And you don't know, and I don't know either. They had one year. One year. To redeem the time and reach their valley. How many people died? I have no idea. Now, I'm just going to say this to you. Time short. When you read the letter to the Colossian church, realize they had one year to put into practice 
what they were exhorted to do. I can't promise you I'll be alive tomorrow. I don't know where we'll be or who you, what will happen to you. We don't know. You've had friends that all of a sudden, I mean, we don't know. I don't know about them. But it's not that self tomorrow. You don't know what a day brings forth. So the time is short. Even if, even if we live a full life, okay? They say just shy of 80 years, okay? Let's say you get five extra. Well, we, some of us have got a whole lot more behind us than we do ahead of us. Max just celebrated 9-0. That's incredible. I'm just saying this. Let's take the time we've got and make the most of it. Boy, that's my heart. Dear God, please. Please, whatever I got left. Please, please squeeze every drop out of it for your glory. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Help us, I pray, God, to be busy about this matter of serving you and of telling people about Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you for what you do. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray these things. Amen. <music>